you've probably heard of the quality criteria objectivity, reliability and validity, right? These are characteristic of good quantitative research. But for qualitative research, they mostly don't make sense. So please join me to explore the six quality criteria of qualitative research. And now, without further ado, welcome to Schreib. So why do the quality criteria of quantitative research do not apply for qualitative research? Let's look at objectivity, for example. Just think of an ethnographic research project where a scientist goes into the field to observe people or other subjects in the natural environment. Here objectivity can actually be a major hindrance and the opposite is needed. So is everything allowed in qualitative research? No, of course not. There are also a number of criteria for good qualitative research that help ensure your research design is methodologically sound. Number one. Rule guidedness. This criterion means that qualitative research must be conducted according to clear and predefined rules. You need to determine the procedure in advance so that you can systematically carry out your analysis based on these steps. Rule guidedness is important to ensure that the research process is structured and comprehensible. This helps minimize potential errors or biases that you do not want. You need to document your decisions and procedures precisely so that other researchers can understand and verify the results. By adhering to rule guidedness, you increase the likelihood that other researchers will achieve similar results if they would use the same research design and rules. Here qualitative researchers who follow an interpretivist philosophy would disagree because they see the researchers own subjectivity and experiences that influence the analysis as a clear strength. However, rule guidedness is still an important principle even for interpretivist qualitative studies. To implement this in your own qualitative work, I recommend following an author or a methods book closely or pretty close and carrying out the suggested approach as best as you can. In your methods section, you might write something like this thematic analysis is conducted according to the recommendations of Brown and Clark. In the first step, I did this, and in the second step, I did that. Of course, this doesn't mean you have to follow every methods book from start to finish. Minor adjustments are certainly possible, and being methodologically flexible is a major advantage of qualitative research. However, it would be worthless without rules. Criterion number two. Procedural documentation. You might know from quantitative research that statistical tests are pretty much standardized. There is not much room for deviating from an established procedure. In qualitative research we just learned that being flexible and changing the course of a method can be of value. So if you do this, quality criterion number two comes into play. You must document the entire research process as precisely as possible. Your documentation should include the preliminary understanding that you have, the composition of the analysis methods and the practical implementation of data collection and analysis. Your procedural documentation should be clear and precise so that other researchers can follow the steps and verify the results if needed. By carefully documenting your procedures of data collection and analysis in particular, you ensure transparency and make it easier to communicate that your findings actually come from the data that you collected and you not just made them up. To implement this, I recommend presenting your overall research design as an illustration that shows all the steps. Data collection, analysis step one, analysis step two, and so on. Then you include this figure into your research design section. Criterion number three, proximity to the subject. In any type of qualitative research, it is important to establish proximity to the subject of investigation. You can fulfill this requirement by directly immersing yourself in the so-called life world of the people you study. Instead of bringing the research subjects into a lab, you go into the everyday situations of the people you interview or observe. It is also important to establish an open and equal relationship with the person being studied. Unlike in an experiment, you must, for example, clearly explain to your participant 
what your research is about and why you do it. This creates a mutual interest between you as a researcher and the study person, allowing for a close connection to the research subject. At the end of the investigation, it is important to check whether you succeeded in making the research understandable and accessible to the participants. In practice, this means explaining your research goals and why the insights of the participants are valuable to your study whenever you communicate with people. Even afterwards, involve them and share your results. This way you can give something back. Criterion number four, communicative validation. Staying in contact with the people you study also allows you to verify your findings. Try to discuss your findings with your participants and other relevant people and get their feedback. This feedback is used to verify and possibly correct your findings and your interpretations. This way, you can identify possible errors or inaccurate interpretations and improve the results. You'll find that many will say, oh, I never thought about it in that way before. That's always a good sign. Throughout the research process, you should be open to feedback from participants and take their comments seriously to continuously improve your research. Now, before we get to criterion number five, please consider giving this video a like if you enjoyed the content. It would really help me out a lot. Criterion number five, triangulation. Triangulation means taking different perspectives. For example, you could use various data sources. You could collaborate with other authors and researchers. You could exchange opinions, consider different theoretical approaches or methods to validate your findings. Your goal is not to achieve a definitive answer. This is how the reality looks like, but to highlight the strengths and weaknesses of different perspectives. A practical example would be adding a second data source. If you primarily conduct interviews, you could also collect and analyze some archival documents you find online. If you want to learn more about this principle, check out my tutorial on triangulation in research. It's linked right here in the top right corner. Criterion number six. Validation based on arguments. In qualitative research, you, as the researching subject, are required to interpret certain facts. It's not about achieving the most statistically generalizable and objective result. Unlike the results from statistical tests that are reported in quantitative studies, your interpretations cannot be directly checked for accuracy. Nevertheless, there is a rule in qualitative research. You must not simply assert interpretations, but you must always justify them. In argumentative validation, the preliminary understanding that you have and the respective interpretation must align so that the interpretation is guided by theoretical considerations. Okay, that was a mouthful. So what, it, what this means is the interpretation itself must be coherent and you must explain any possible inconsistencies. And to support your interpretation, you can also consider and check alternative interpretations, for example, from other theories. Even rebuttals or negative viewpoints can contribute to securing and justifying your interpretations. This supports the validity of your results. In practice, if you want to remove any doubt that your interpretations are valid, you should provide as much raw data as possible. You can feel free to include a quote of eight to 10 sentences even, if it is particularly interesting for a certain type of code or category in your paper or thesis. I often see students including direct quotes from their data that are exactly one sentence long. This makes it difficult to grasp the context of the statement. So please include longer uh, quotes from your raw data in your findings section. This makes your interpretations that you put forth later easier to follow and for you to justify. Now let's summarize. These six criteria are important, but not all of them need to be followed for every qualitative study. As it is often the case with qualitative research, it depends. Every research project is unique, which requires flexible criteria and you being responsible for doing the best job you can. You should also know that I took these criteria from one particular author called Myring, who wrote about them extensively in his widely cited methods books. Other sources may suggest four or eight quality criteria. 
Although these other sources might name them differently, the principles remain the same. If you take the six mentioned criteria seriously and try to consider most of them when developing your qualitative research design, you are on the right track.